All right, good morning, everyone. We are about to begin our worship service. So those at home, uh, now's the time to uh, start uh, start kind of leaning into your screen a little bit. Uh, those that are in the uh, auditorium, let's find our seats. Uh, and uh, guys, we're going to have a great, great worship service. We're going to start with a couple of songs. But before we do all that, uh, let's go to God in prayer. Father, we thank you so very much for all that you have done for us. God, and I don't mean just the physical blessings of where we live and the things we get to enjoy. I mean the things that are inherently yours that you decided to share with us. Your spirit. The very fact that uh, you could have lived in buildings, you could have... You could have made the temple the, the, the cornerstone of everything that you are, but yet you chose to live within people you have created. God, you, you gave us your choice where we get to, we get to decide and, and think through and reason and give to you because we are so moved by who you are. God, you've given us your love. God, without it, we wouldn't even know what love was. We wouldn't know how to even do anything for one another outside of just meet maybe basic needs. God, we would just be people of instinct and of nature, just giving in constantly to cravings. But love, love showed us a better way. God, none of that is natural among us. But because of who you are, Father, we have that to the point where it's almost normal. God, let it be the new normal. Father, we want to worship you today in a way that not only says thank you, but that glorifies you. So be with us as we sing, whether we're at home or in the building. God, be let the, let the words of praise stir us from the inside out. Let your word move us deeply. As we, as we sit at your feet, God, wanting to understand your ways better. Father, and let us just leave this time knowing you better, having, having had a chance to bond with our brothers and sisters. God, help us to have the vision for the community around us that you have. And pour all of those things which you have given to us freely out into a world that desperately needs it. God, we love you so much, and we pray this on your son's name. Amen. I have uh, one thing that's going on right now is that uh, Vince Hawkins is obviously not with us this morning. He actually had to go to Louisiana to uh, be uh, at a funeral for a family member. So big loss to their family, and we'll pray for him later. But Vince, if you're watching, you're the host, and we need you to make uh, Gateway AV the host. So, bro, glad you're watching. Glad you're faithful to your own congregation, brother. But we need you to stop it and to make uh, Gateway AV the host. So this is a family program right here. We're, you know, he's making impact wherever he goes. Oh, okay, I'm going to keep filling until we get this thing figured out. Hopefully Vince didn't go, I'll just turn it on. Oh, okay, we're good, we're good. 
Thank you, Vince. You're the best, brother. We miss we you. Miss we're praying for you. you. And now we're going to worship God together. Hear my heart. 
Sunday morning. All right. So my name's Sam Fall, and I'd just like to uh, give, share for the contribution today. Uh, before I start that, I have been authorized to uh, let you know of an event that uh, my family group is putting on. It's a Nerf War. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Got a lot of interest. So that's going to be next Saturday at uh, 1 p.m. Uh, Art Hill in Forest Park, and got a, if you don't have a Nerf gun, don't worry, we got you covered. We got a lot, like 1,500 darts, we're good, <laughs> and and extra guns. Okay, so <laughs> that said, for contribution, uh, I'd like to talk about giving and giving with your possessions. Yes, there is uh, giving directly to the church through you know monetary. But also there's the spirit of giving and how much can you give? How much should you give? Uh, this is actually uh, relevant to me right now. Oh, go ahead and take that off. This is relevant to me right now because I've had a big dream of owning a house someday. And it sounds like that's going to happen in the near future. I just got pre-approved for a mortgage. Uh, so it's getting real. But with that getting real comes the question of, well, what's the house going to be like? Uh, who's it going to be for? Because everybody who's ever bought a house knows that there's what you want, there's what your family wants, there's what your friends want, there's what your dog wants, there's what the guy or gal 10 years from now who's going to buy it from you wants. 
And so all of that goes into buying a house. What type of house? Well, what type of house could you give away? That's an interesting question, isn't it? You, nobody buys a house to give it away. Let's look at a scripture. And I think, I think Christ has an interesting take on how to, uh, to solve this problem. So in Matthew 14, 18 through 20, this is the feeding of the 5,000, and I'll just read it for sake of uh, time. But Christ is talking to the disciples, and uh, the people had come to him for teaching. He says, give them something. They said, we don't have anything. And verse 18, I'll pick up. Bring them here to me, he said. And he, talking about the, the loaves and fishes, he said, direct the people to sit down on the grass. Take the five loaves and the two fishes, or excuse me, taking the five loaves and the two fishes, and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and broke the loaves. He then gave them to his, the disciples, and the disciples gave to the people. Now, he gave away the same five loaves and two fishes over 5,000 times, if you think about it. He multiplied them. And really, isn't that what we're trying to do? We're trying to multiply what God has given us. Now, this may seem like a miracle, but what, what if I told you we all can do the very same thing? How many times can you give away a dollar? Can you give it away multiple times? Banks do that all the time. <laughs> How many times can you give away a house? Can you give it away multiple times? It's called renting, <laughs> which I'm doing right now. Point is, though, we are lending the value or benefit of something to someone else. And the beauty of it is you can do it multiple times. It is only a lack of ingenuity and will that would stop us from giving away a harvest that would bring uh, good to the world, which isn't so badly in need. So... Given that, what, what's the downside? Obviously, there's a sacrifice. You have to be willing to sacrifice your own interests for others. You have to be willing to choose things that are designed to help others, but that can be given away. Because what's, what's the ultimate call here? What did Christ say about the, the blade of grass that's today and tomorrow thrown into the furnace? Christ lived... The, uh, this life is a fire sale. By the time he died, everything was gone. He gave away everything. He gave away his possessions, his body, his life. He even gave away his mom, John, <laughs> for, to take care of. But the point is, he had nothing left. He gave it all away. <laughs> this is a fire sale we are all living. He's the example. Amen. By the time we're done, the goal is not to be holding on to anything. That's how we give as much as possible. And there's only a limited, uh, a lack of imagination and will that stops us from changing the world. So let's follow Christ's example. Let's lay up treasure in heaven so that we know our heart will be in the right place. Let's go ahead and pray. Lord, as we consider uh, the way you gave to us, the way you gave every lasting thing that you had, your last drop of blood, for our benefit, Lord. I pray that we would follow that example, that we would learn from it, and realize that you gave us this example because it is the best way, the most reasonable service, and the highest good for all, all men, all uh, people, and yourself. Bless yourself, Lord. Glorify yourself, and help us to carry this message with us all the year long. As we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm just a little taller. <laughs> good morning, everybody. It's so good to be with everybody. And hello to everybody out who's online. Uh, thanks for joining us this morning. We have a lot of announcements. I have been given permission for to make the announcements longer than Bill's actual sermon if I need to. <laughs> I don't know if that'll be necessary, but we're, we'll, uh, we'll get through these uh, one at a time. Okay, first of all, like Sam mentioned, they have the Nerf War uh, this coming weekend. Um, that'll be super fun. Please come out if you, if you want to 
hope you enjoy uh, Nerf Wars. <laughs> um, singles online devotional is this Friday, April 16th at 7 p.m. Um, singles, please check the group me for the Zoom link, or you can contact Felicia Rogers uh, by email or by text uh, if you need that link. And um, the email for Felicia is in the church app if you need to contact her. Uh, this Friday, we also have our mobile market for April. And uh, the, the sign-up is open now. Uh, as usual, we need volunteers that are willing to commit from 9.30 when we set up till 1 p.m. when we tear down. Uh, the actual market will take place from 11 until 1. You do not need to have uh, show proof of income, but you do need to drive through. It is a contactless market, just like all of our other markets. And uh, last time, we had some amazing <laughs> stuff. We had gourmet pepperoni and salami <laughs> that Vanessa Catalanato told me it, uh, it normally retails for, I don't know, like $5 for like two little slices, and we were giving away 10-pound bags of it. So, yeah, and then we had milk, we had bread, a lot of good uh, staples, uh, potatoes, things like that. We almost always have vegetables. So if you know somebody that needs food, um, please send them our way on Friday. Uh, no proof of income required. Uh, you just need to have a car. It doesn't have to be even your own car, um, but you just you need to drive through. <laughs> um, this coming Sunday, we have our house church Sunday. We will not be here. Well, I don't know. Maybe one of maybe one of the groups will be here. I don't know. But um, talk to your house church leaders uh, to find out what your plans are, because each house church is making their own plans, and um, good times will be had by y'all. Um, we are going to be continuing to meet for on Zoom for our midweeks in April. We have our men's midweek this coming Wednesday in a few days from now. And uh, then our women's midweek is at the end of the month as usual on April 28th. Uh, the Zoom links for both can be found in the app. And, uh, <coughs> excuse me. Oh, prom. Okay, prom. Let's talk about prom. Prom, it, today's the last day to register. So parents... If you are procrastinators, this is your moment. This is your moment. We've got 44 kids registered. Uh, we would love to see more of you there. So if you, but, and registration is only $65. It includes uh, dinner at the beautiful Andre's Banquet Center and then also after prom afterwards. Uh, but if you uh, have not registered, this is the last day. I mean it, really, really, really the last day. If you, if you wait until tomorrow, you're going to call me or Jeanette, and we're going to have to tell you no, and then you'll be sad. So get registered today. <laughs> so, um, and then also, uh, another, another fast-approaching deadline, let's talk about camp. So camp is a little different this year in that we have a registration cap. And right now, we are over 60% full. So we've got about 60 spots left. If you have not registered parents, get registered today, tomorrow, Tuesday, but do it very, very, very soon because those spots are going to go. And I would expect that registration is probably going to have to close by the end of this month at the rate things are going. Um, we are having a webinar this coming Tuesday uh, to answer questions about COVID-19 protocols and recommendations and just how camp is going to look this year. And all parents and counselors-to-be are invited to attend that. The link for that can be found in the app, but hopefully by now, um, if you are a parent, you probably have also received it by email too. I think that. Oh, yeah, I thought I mentioned that at the beginning. Yeah. <laughs> we really want you to come to the singles devotional if you're single. Um, oh, if you do need communion cups, if you are worshiping from home, we're glad to have you. If you need communion cups, you're running low, uh, come talk to myself, Jim Debros, or, or Julie Schrader. Uh, oh, and we have our prayer times. Prayer is, prayer is so necessary and needed, um, especially right now. If you, um, you want to join us, we have prayer time on Monday night. There's two of them. Uh, the Super Prayer Warrior time is at 8.15 on Mondays um, on Zoom. And then the elders' prayer call is just a dial-in call, and that's at 8.30. Uh, the links for both can be found inside the app. On Tuesday, we, we still have our, quiet, our quiet times. On, Tues on Tuesday, we have it with the Hawkins, and on Thursdays is with the Moldens. Both are at 7.30 a.m., and the links for each can be found inside our Zoom app. And then um, if, you are, if you have a parent and you have a, ki a kiddo who's fifth grade or under, we do have our kids' worship on Sundays. Uh, 
you're too late this, this Sunday, but next Sunday it'll be at 8.30. Um, the link for that can be found inside the church app. And uh, if you need to give your contribution online, uh, the, the link for that can also be found in the app as well if you aren't giving online but you would like to start. I think that's it. <laughs> <laughs> that's a really, really long enough. That's a lot longer than what I normally take. So let's, uh, let's have one more song. Let's shake it out and uh, stand up for one more song, and then Bill's going to come on up and preach the word.
Amen. That was uh, our uh, sister church from Orlando leading us in that uh, song, uh, Power. And uh, that's exactly where we're going in the sermon today. Uh, we are uh, going through the book of Acts. Uh, we have uh, started this whole year with the theme of uh, great news, good news, uh, being our, our central core, because that is the central call of all that Luke is trying to do, both in his gospel and in the book of Acts. He is wanting to make sure that we, as his readers, are, are informed and educated into what is the true gospel. Gospel was a word shared all across Rome. It was a political word that really was always used to, to announce the coming of the new emperor. Anytime a big official uh, was coming into a Roman town, they would send heralds ahead and they would announce good news. The gospel, the euangelion, uh, uh, the, the, the king has come. And the city would just get crazy busy getting the city ready to receive its king. The church took that title. Kind of grabbed it and made its own, saying, you guys have the right idea that when someone like a king comes, it is good news. It needs to be announced. It needs to be told. Because the news is that the one who rules is coming to see you and so Luke takes a very orderly account that as we read his gospel he is wanting you to know this is the king that has come to you but then in the book of Acts he wants people to know just because you think you might have put him in the ground you most certainly did not in fact you released his true power, his true greatness is not that power resided in one man, but one man could overcome death and then pour that power out into people like you and me. It is the good news. And all throughout the book of Acts, we are getting told time and time again how this announcement, this news is now coming to people who didn't know it was coming. Acts 2 was a total surprise, not only to the people listening to the apostles, but to the apostles themselves. It was, it was kicked off by the outpouring of the Spirit, which they quoted Joel chapter 2. In the last days, the, the Lord says, I will pour out my Spirit on the all people. All people. What do you mean by all people? Men and women. What? Yeah, men and women were going to get the Spirit. Men and women were going to prophesy. Men and women were going to tell even servants. What? Yes, servants. Your male and female servants. You kind of get this idea that God's going the extra mile to make sure all are included. And he even mentions the fact that nations were going to receive this. And it was the great beginning. And those that believed the message recognized what they what they had received. It was the good news. It was the king has come and is now pouring out what we now see and hear. He poured out his kingdom into us and we now get to join him, not a physical kingdom made up of walls as though it needed to be defended, but one that is always mobile, one that is always able to go out, one that will attack the very gates of hell. And boy, they are buying in. And so far, there's been a lot of great news associated with the good news uh, in the Jewish community. Uh, but we've seen a little bit of trouble come our way as uh, they've started to learn that you don't mess with the Spirit. Ananias and Sapphira kind of tried to fake the funk right there, and they paid dearly for it. Great fear is seizing. And by fear, we don't mean they were scared of them. It's just there was some respect in the community. Like, God is literally not in his temple. He is in these people. And like when you've messed around with God's temple, sometimes you pay the price with your life. If you mess with the spirit in these people, this new temple, sometimes the results are the same. 
And of course, what God does once, he does it for all. Doesn't mean that's always going to happen. But it certainly meant that something was happening. You know, we kind of we kind of walked through very quickly last week in our Easter celebration. Was it last week awesome? Oh my goodness. I mean, we we started praying in January for an unusual weekend of weather, didn't we? Weren't we really specific about that? And then like meteorologists were like, we've never seen an early April Sunday like this before in our lives. And and, and of course we're going, oh yeah, we've been praying for that. You change the weather, people. And I know that we're laughing, but come on. Prayer does change things. And you know it to be true because every time you have a loss, every time your family's hit hard by hardship, we know where to go. You know, the church in Acts would do that too. When they were lost without direction, you got to remember Easter for us is always a celebration, but Easter for them was also a departure because the one they love was going to leave. You know, the ascension was awesome. We kind of go, yeah, he disappeared, but you have to understand how lonely that must have been. There's a dark side to Easter that we never talk about because for them, It was now, it's all on us. And the book of Acts is reminding them time and time again, no, it's not. To which we can say amen, because they make mistakes. We have Hellenistic widows getting overlooked in the daily distribution of food, which was was a, a separation of culture, not of race. But now in our journey through the book of Acts, we it's about to get racial. Because after Stephen is martyred, they start to recognize the great persecution that is breaking out because Stephen flat laid truth. They laid a truth bomb on the powers that be that the very ones that crucified Christ are now coming after his followers. They're no longer listening to to Gamaliel. He had his day where he talked them out of killing these folks. But now they're like, oh, these guys have to go. If they're going to be talking to us like Stephen dared talk to us, if they're going to start using our history to try to convince us we're guilty of this man's blood, when we know that we were serving God and doing it, it was like, yeah, you were serving God, but not in the way that you thought. You were just setting them up for the easy layup. And now persecution has broken out, and now... These people are getting scattered. And Vince is going to do a great job on on the theology of scattering so that we can gather. That's going to be a great lesson. But I just want us to know that as they scattered, they went to weird places. What do you mean weird places? They went to Samaria. In fact, we follow Philip out there. And the Samaritans receive the word. Now, let's go to Acts chapter 8, and let's begin in verse 9. It says, Now for some time, a man named Simon had practiced sorcery in the city and amazed all the people of Samaria. He boasted that he was someone great, and all people, both high and low, gave them gave him their attention and exclaimed, this man is rightly called the great power of God. They followed him because he had amazed them for a long time with his sorcery. But when they believed Philip, as he proclaimed the good news of the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Simon himself believed and was baptized. He followed Philip everywhere astonished by the great signs and miracles he saw when the apostles in jerusalem heard that samaria had accepted the word of god they sent peter and john to samaria when they arrived they pray for these new believers there that they might receive the holy spirit because the holy spirit had not come on any of them yet they 
uh, they had simply been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then Peter and John placed their hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. When Simon saw that the Spirit was given at the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money and said, Give me also this ability so that everyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. Peter answered, May your money perish with you because you thought you could buy the gift of God with money. You have no part or share in this ministry because your heart is not right before God. Repent of this wickedness and pray to the Lord in the hope that he may forgive you for having such a thought in your heart. For I see that you are full of bitterness and captive to sin. Simon answered, pray to the Lord for me so that nothing you have said may happen to me. Amen. After they had further proclaimed the word of the Lord and testified about Jesus, Peter and John returned to Jerusalem preaching the gospel, the good news, in many Samaritan villages. Yeah, wow. You know, this story is important to us because we have a weird relationship with power. This story is all about power and as we start to break it down and i'm going to get to the kind of what was going on with the laying on of the apostles hands that's an important teaching moment and everyone's like going okay good because that's the only question we have but i you're at, that's the wrong question this is a story about power you know and power is one of those things that that is hard to define because it changes depending on who you ask. You know, when you, when you consider power, as I said, a picture in your mind, if you could capture an image, uh, a one-word image of when I say power, what you think. What do you think of? Probably images maybe of cash come to mind. Position come to mind. Title come to mind. Maybe education comes to mind. Maybe it's a maybe it's a it's a room full of people and you're at the head. Whoever's in that seat has the power. But we got to think about it more naturally. Sam alluded to this in his great communion message this morning. We all have power. Like who's going to sit in the front seat on the way home? That's a power play. Who gets to pick where we eat for lunch? Or what we eat for lunch? That's a power move. Who gets to control the remote? It's like, okay, now you're meddling, preacher. But we all have power on some level. On some level, we have, we have choice. We have the ability to choose. You know, one of my great joys in Chicago was being able to work on the Skyline Project, which we're going to do something very similar here starting in the fall. But we got a chance to work with middle-aged school kids that are in the inner city, you know, who literally have been told, you have no power. You might as well just go with the flow. And our whole program was like, you got power? You got choice. And the whole program was just about making decisions. And they started seeing this in their, you know, because when we got them, one of their favorite pastimes was having these rap roast battles. You know, where they would get up and one person would insult someone and they would some, come, someone would come back. And they were all looking for the ooh moment, right? You know, and we go, well, what if we took that and gave you some power? We just change one little rule. It's got to be a boast roast. You cannot cut them down. You have to build them up. And it was funny because they went, eh! and they had to think about it. Meanwhile, that poor beatboxer is just losing their breath. Like, <laughs> Are you guys going to start anytime soon? But then after a while, they started doing it. They'd be like, Amari, you're so smart. Math teachers have you check their math. 
Ooh. And they just started going back and forth. They just started, they started thinking of ways to build people up. And then we asked them at the end of this little exercise, it was one of those that wasn't in our program plan. It was just, let's take advantage of what we're seeing happening here. And we asked them, how did that feel? Like, how do y'all feel right now? And they were like, that was so fun. That was, I, I feel good not only about myself, but I feel good about every. And I was like, power. You exercised power. You changed the atmosphere by just adding one little thing to something you were already doing. It's power. We all have it. But if you try to define it, you have to be careful in who you ask. If you ask a physics professor what power is, you know, power is the rate at which work gets done. Thanks. You know, and then they give you an equation and test you on it, right? If you had a asked a political science professor what power is, they would say power is the ability to get what we want. Oh, thanks. That sounds like a lot of fun. And if you go to the uh, sociology department and ask them, okay, well, where does power come from? They would note that this is a very complicated set of ever-changing rules. That's why you have to take college courses. You have to come to us to learn about these ever-morphing things, the interplay of factors of age, education, social economic status, intellect, sex, and physical strength. All of these things play into power. How silly of you to ask me how to, how to define where power comes from. You know, you know and you kind of go, oh, sociologists, right? <laughs> Social sciences. <laughs> Whatever. But if you ask a theologian, all of a sudden, it doesn't get any easier. Those theologians, you can't have any fun when there are theologians in the room. Because I am one, so, so uh, I know. Because when you ask them, it's about this, this thing that ultimately all power only has one source. It all comes from God. And God enjoys the power of ownership. He owns it all. He was never, nothing ever gave power to him. He is the source of it. He is the originator of it. Our God has to be in this place of being the only one that owns it all so that he can now give it away. And the very nature of God that makes him so great and so worthy of praise is that when he has all power, he chooses to share it. He, choo he chooses to give it. And so in, in one breath, he kind of has a simple answer. Well, it all comes from God. What is power? Power is what God does with who he is. He creates. He gives. He serves. And of course, in this thing, we get the, we get the story of creation in that he not only creates man, but he gives men jobs that, that rightfully belongs to him. He, he gives men the opportunity to choose. He gave them choice. And you kind of go, why give away all that power? Because love demands choice. He did this because in giving away power, he can now have a relationship where there is a give and take, not just, just obey, obey, obey. Now it's all about Love. And again, that kind of goes, wow, this is a really deep subject. But our story, our story talks about the human confusion when it comes to power. And it's, it's symbolized by one man, Simon Magnus. This guy was in Samaria. Samaria is uh, the tribe of mixed kids uh, in Israel. They're not, not that they were, they were really mixed. They, their ancestors had intermarried when they were left in the land during the time of the exile. Israel had sinned, and because of their sin, God said, hey, if you sin in these ways, you're going to lose the land, the very land I gave you. 
I gave you the power to have this land. And if you don't honor me and treat it right, then I'm going to take it away from you. You're going to go into exile. So they went into exile, except not all of them. They left some of the less than people behind because someone had to work the land. And those that were left behind that were considered not worthy of taking into exile, boy, how low do you have to be on that totem pole to be left in the land? Well, they had to make a way. So the people that the the conquering nation Babylon sent into the land to help them work the land, they started intermarrying. Now, to their credit, they actually became a little bit more Jewish than they had been prior to that intermarriage. They started holding to laws, started holding to basic tenets of Judaism, probably a little bit more faithfully than Israel itself at times, which then created a rival thing. Because now somewhere in their past, their blood had been intermixed. And so now for the first time, we have a racial issue in the church. The church has gone out to Samaria, who was being deceived and impressed and wowed by a guy named Simon, whose business card read, the power of God that is called great. Give me a call sometime. Everyone was impressed with all the tricks he was doing. Everyone was there. And of course, Jews would look at this and go, see, that's how deceived they are that someone like that could get away with all that being called the power of God, being called the power of God, which is called great. But as the church goes, the gospel comes and starts making an announcement. Hey, the king, the real power is here. Philip is there, he's performing miracles, and now they're starting to say, These, this is not trickery. Those that had needs, their needs were being met. Those that had seemed to be unchangeable were changing, and they believed the word of God and repented and got baptized. Men and women. Once again, you kind of see what what the early church is doing, which again, I just want to say the Bible is the greatest liberator of everyone on the planet. And so these people are starting to come in. Now, our very Jewish church is a little skeptical. They're like, we have to go see what is going on. So they sent their best not not just you know not just anyone they sent peter and john go why did they go because they had to see has the kingdom of god that was poured out onto us in acts chapter 2 do they are they a part of the same thing they believed they repented they got the 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 promised holy spirit the indwelling but but do they belong to us are they a separate group or are they with us Peter and John go out to sea. And as they go out to sea, the things that came on them suddenly, like out of the sky and heaven, you know, all these abilities, all these signs that kind of said, see, Joel chapter 2, it's happening. Joel chapter 2, it's happening. They saw that, and what they did not see happening was the Holy Spirit doing those same types of signs. So Peter and John, being the great entrepreneurs of faith, said, well, what if we lay hands on them? Because that's what we did with the seven, and they just did some awesome things. So if we lay hands on them, what would happen? Besides, if it works for f- uh, waiting on tables, regardless of what happens here, it'll work for them. They'll, they'll have some leadership. They'll have some people that can give. So the, you know, the apostles start laying hands on people, and then all of a sudden, the signs that showed that the kingdom had come and Acts chapter 2 started showing up in those the apostles laid their hands on them. They are the blood of, of Jews. These God accepts them. God has brought them in. They are a part of the same kingdom, which is why the Bible is very clear that it had not fallen upon or been poured out upon them like it had to the Jews in Acts chapter 2. So this moment is a moment where the question's being asked, are they one of us? Because our whole lives we have been trained that they're not one of us. 
But does God accept them as disciples? And because of the laying on of hands and the gifts that followed them that were like the ones in Acts chapter 2, the answer is an overwhelming yes. But that's not what this story is about. It's about this insatiable need to know that there is power. Power was being exerted in kind of a, a fake way through Simon for years. And people were flocking to him because people will gravitate to anything they think could give them power. The Greeks were like this. They, had, they built incredible temples to the oracle at Delphi, which, which was so elaborate. Uh, 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 the uh, Artemis, as we'll meet later, has this incredible temple because they're trying to leverage some power. They're willing to give anything, even the blood of their own children, to try to manufacture and to pry out of the fates, out of the gods, some sort of blessing. Give me some sort of assurance. Give me some sort of window into the future that will let me know what can I take stock in? What can I trust? What can I give my heart to? Can I, can I do anything of substance? They wanted to know. People in Samaria wanted to know. People in Jerusalem wanted to know. They're all looking for the same thing because that's exactly what we're looking for in America today. Now we mask it up. We make it pretty. But look where the money goes. Look where you pour your time. Look where we try to do this. We are, we are constantly figuring out if I have any sort of power, how can I use it to help further my cause along? If I have any sort of power, how can I use it to, to either give something for me or to give something to God? And what we see here is a power grab. Philip shows up. He's not trying to take control. He's just preaching the gospel. Power is being exerted. People are believing. Simon even believed and was baptized. Now, again, all of us have walked, watched the play upside down, and we're kind of going, was this a fake baptism? We don't have really any indication one way or the other. It just says he believed and was baptized. You make your own call. But remember, be careful how you judge. And so, says he, and so he starts following Peter, uh, Philip around. Peter and John show up, and they, they see them passing on these gifts. Simon's like, I will do anything to have that ability. And that's where I think the sermon lies. You have something within you that is so great. Jesus tried to use the most colorful language he could to get you to understand what you have. He called it a pearl of great price. In a time when you kind of eked out a, an existence on whatever you could get the ground to produce. Finding a treasure in a field as you're trying to plow that field. Trying to trying to, trying to get, get through, take a shortcut because you don't have the ability to ride a, uh, an animal and you come across a treasure in a field. You're a merchant trying to do kill yourself all the time to try to find something that would guarantee your family in existence and then you find a pearl of great price. He goes, what do you do? You give away whatever you got to give away in order to get that treasure. You'll sell whatever you got to sell in order to get that pearl. You do whatever you can to have that. And Jesus is trying to get our imaginations to ignite. You have something. If you have the gospel, if you have the kingdom, you have something that is worth so much more than what you go to work for on Monday. You already have a guarantee. You already have something that no one else has. You have access to peace of mind. You have access to God who chooses to be known as Father. You have, it at, you have access to the things that you cannot explain. And all you have to do is kind of go, I renounce my self-reliance and I'm going to go with this. 
I'm going to go after God. I'm going to use that to God because I know when Sam got up here and said, can you give a house away? We kind of go, well, I, theoretically, I guess we could. But then when he broke it down, it's like, no. What are you going to use that house for? And we could just extend that out into everything, can't we? What will you do today to glorify God in the decisions that you make? You know, we see this happen when we're newlyweds, right? When you go from building your own kingdom to now having to share up to half your kingdom. You didn't realize that little one-bedroom apartment that you shared with three guys was a kingdom, but it was. You know, you, you, put, you put your name on all the stuff in your fridge that was yours because that was your kingdom. You got mad if someone violated that sacred trust. Someone ate your can of beans. You didn't even like that can of beans, but it was on sale. And then someone, by God's grace, came into your life and actually liked you. And you built a relationship, it turned into love, and by the grace of God, you got married. And now all of a sudden, you're in a, you're in a space. You thought you were going to be free from the need to share, but now it's demanded of you every day. Newlyweds can testify. This is where it gets real. You thought you were sacrificial until you have to do it every day. And just when you think you got that down, the Lord sometimes gives you a baby who can't do anything for you until they're 24. I mean, the baby is the worst investment of your resources you will ever make. I mean, let's I mean, let's set aside the cuteness for a moment. Let's just be honest, man. Man, that is a losing investment. You're creating a human that all they know how to do from the womb is take. And you do it and you're so fired up. Look at this baby who's draining us of all of our strength and beauty. Don't you isn't it cute? Oh yes, it's cute. You know, in fact, we started even getting possessive of our babies. You know, the first one is like, don't touch, don't breathe. And then by the third, you're just like, here, you take them. You, you know, anything over three, you're just like, hey, if we go home with, with you know, three out of five, I'm good with that. Right. You know, I mean, what we, what, all of a sudden what we have is this growing sense of giving away power, which makes us a little bit more like God. Because Simon had it, had it all confused. His request was for this, I just want to have power. I want to be great. I want to be noticed. And we see the same spirit in all the YouTubers, all the influencers, all of our kids that are trying to think of videos that might get them seen, that might get them noticed, that might get them... It's the same spirit. I want to count. I want to matter. I want to know that my, when this is all said and done, someone's going to remember me. And as, as that spirit comes, we kind of go, well, where does this come from? It comes from this, this misunderstanding of power. So where do we go? What do we do? What did Simon miss? He believed the gospel. God, who has all power, has come in the form of one man. Well, that's pretty limiting. Oh, you haven't heard limiting yet, Simon. He then walked on the earth and did things for others. You mean he wasn't served? No, he wasn't served. He came as one who serves. In fact, try to find anything positive Jesus said about being the leader. It's not in there. The only thing he says about leadership is don't do it like them. Everything else is about following. 
And so here Jesus is kind of coming in the form of a man, and Simon's mind is just getting blown. He doesn't know what to do with when you have all power, you give it away. Not only do you give it away, you allow yourself to be put to death. Well, what happens when you're put to death? Then you see power. When mankind in its fallen state and its self-creation of hell starts to pour into one man, what does he do? He swallows it up in the victory of the empty tomb. He comes up out of that, comes through it, comes all the way out to then just do what he did the, his whole time to give it away, Simon, which is the power you, power, now, power you now see and hear. And Simon's like, okay, now that's something worth having. And then he says, I will like to buy this from you. And then Peter lays the rebuke of the Bible onto this poor soul. Now remember what Peter had just experienced with Ananias and Sapphira. Let's not be too critical of him. He knows life and death is in the balance. I think he gave an appropriate rebuke with considering the circumstances he had just lived through. Like, no, don't bring up money. You cannot, you, you just got it all wrong. Your heart's not right. You need to repent. And pray that God might forgive you. That's never encouraging. When someone says to you, pray that God might forgive you. I'm not sure about this one. We don't see a man smited. We don't see someone that needs to get buried. In fact, we're not told anything of Simon after this. And you want to know why Luke does that? It's because there is Simon in every one of us. Jesus would say, hey, you can't serve two masters. It's either God or money. That the chief rival of God would be what you decide to do with what you have. Whose glory? Are you living for today? Whose glory are you giving your energy to today? Very few would come out and say, well, like, well, I'm totally living for myself. We're honestly just not that self-aware. And that's where Satan likes us just blissfully unaware. Which is why I think the story is written the way it is. Why we're not told, well, how did it turn out for Simon? What did he end up doing? How, how does he thought of in church history? We, we really don't know. In fact, there are two traditions. Both one is bad and one is really good. We just don't know conclusively what happened. And Luke's like, yeah, I wanted it that way because we're like that. We have to decide today. What will I give my power to? For, will I give it to God or will I continue to use it for myself? And so we're left to wonder, well, what does that mean? And I just want to end with a little story about Jesus. It's told by John in the 13th chapter. It's my, one of my favorite because it humbles me out so much. You know, in John chapter 13, you know, and John knows how to tell a story. He really does. You know, it says in verse 1, Now before the peace of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were, who were in the world, he loved them to the end. During the supper, when the devil had already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going back to God, rose from the supper, laid aside his outer garments. 
and taking up a towel, tied it around his waist. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around him. John is doing a little bit of interpreting for us because he tells us more than just the actions of Jesus, although that would have been enough. He gives us a window into the mindset of God, knowing that the Father had put everything in his control. He had all power. He had all authority. He knew that he was going back to God. He was from God going back to God. He knew how the story was going to play out. He knew what lay ahead. He knew what was what had gone on behind. He knew that in this moment, God had said, you've done it, son. You've already there. You just got a little thing to go through called a crucifixion. And once you get through that, it's going to be done. You're it. Here's all the power. What does he do when he knows he's got all power? When he's not just the most important guy in the room, he's the most important man in human history. When he's got all power, he stands up and wearing the rabbinic robes of separation from your sorry little students, he takes off those robes which would separate him as one above them. He takes off the outer garments that would suggest that, hey, we're not equals. I'm the master, you're the student. He takes off that delineation. He takes off that recognition. He takes off that title and sets it aside. Well, then what does he do? He doesn't just make them equal. He then goes, hey, let me borrow this towel. Pa -pa. You know, and then he just kind of wraps it around. And everyone's like, oh, what is he doing? He is getting dressed to be a slave, to be a servant. He then fills a water basin. You know how awkward this would have been? Like, what is, Jesus, we got someone that will do that for you. I mean, seriously. Are your feet dirty? I thought we took. And then he starts scrubbing those nasty corns of his disciples' feet. And it's not enough that he washed it. It even says, and even wiped it. You know, I mean, why add that little detail? You know, where he's kind of getting in between the toe. I mean, he wiped the feet with the towel. I mean, how up close and personal. And you kind of go, well, that's great for Jesus. What does that have to do with us? What do you do when you're the most important person in the room? In the car. What do you do when you're the most important person in your house or the room? This is where teens start to grow into maturity when the parents leave them in charge. What do you do with that power? Who do you use it for? We all have those moments, right? Where now you're left in charge. What do you do when you have some influence? That can impact others. I'm not talking about just giving, you know, at the mobile food mark every once in a while. I'm not just talking about, you know, being, being in some sort of leadership capacity within the church. I'm just talking about today. When you have the moment to influence, when you have a moment to where you recognize I'm in charge. I tell you, if you took this seriously, your computer usage would change. Your temptations with lust would change. When you, when, you, when, you, when you recognize what God has given you and the opportunity of what this means to handle yourselves and with dignity and with holiness, when you choose to treat others with respect, when someone comes to you and they have, they have a bad attitude and you choose to respond in kindness, when you're a boss and someone gives you a toot, uh, when you're a co-worker and someone gives you a little, little nudge that something's wrong, when someone comes to you and you're the problem that they have, when, what do you do when you have that chance, when you have that power? How do you use it? When Jesus was the most important person in the planet, planet he got up said let me take one for the team here boys let's see the feet and then he says something crazy now that i who you call master 
the power of God who is called great. Now that I, who you rightly call master, have washed your feet, you should go and do likewise. Because if you don't, just get in line with Simon. Because that's exactly where you stand. If you don't, listen to Peter's words very carefully. Because it wasn't just for him. They were, it was for us. Peter heard him himself, didn't he? Get behind me, Satan. You do not have the things of God in mind, but of man. It's the same rebuke. It's the same search for power. It's the same call to you. Stop grabbing for what is not yours. And start taking the things that are yours and giving it to God. Amen. Try to wield some power on that mic stand. All right. That was awesome, Bill. Uh, appreciate that sermon. Um, when I, when I, a lot of times when I am challenged with something like that, like how do I use my power? The most real for me is what am I like at work? Cause that's where most of my waking hours are spent. I don't have kind of the built in accountability that being married to a Christian provides. Cause I know if I'm super selfish, my discipler will hear, hear about it. And, <laughs> <laughs> But, <laughs> but, you know, at work, there's no, I, you know, there's, I'm expected to be worldly, but I, I see myself, you know, I, I see Simon and myself a lot of times just, you know, feeling competitive at work, wanting to, you know, take advantage of having a leg up and just in my attitudes, just always wanting to, you know, exert influence or whatever and putting security in that. So super challenging. Um Appreciate that, Bill, and thank you. So now is the time that we are going to look at, you know, think about Christ and the cross and the power that God exerted through Christ on the cross. And uh, interestingly enough, Sam talked about the, you know, the miraculous feeding with the loaves and fishes. So during the communion, we're going to look at what happened after that. So that night they went across the lake Everybody was on the other side. The, cro the crowds came across the lake, and they found Jesus, and they had a discussion about bread. And uh, I like bread. I don't know about you all, but you know, to those keto people out there, I don't know how you do it, because nothing quite satisfies like a good piece of bread, I think. But Jesus, Jesus was talking about bread here with, with a lot of the people who, who came and found him. Um. And so we're going to read here from John chapter 6, verse 26. So Jesus answered them and said, Truly, truly, I say to you, you seek me not because you saw signs, but because you ate the loaves and were filled. Do not work for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you. For on him, the Father, God, has set his seal." Therefore they said to him, What shall we do so that we may do the work so that we may work the works of God? Jesus answered and said to them, This is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. So they said to him, What then do you do for a sign, so that we may see and believe you? What works do you perform? Our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness. As it is written, he gave them bread out of heaven to eat. You know, so Jesus just, you know, miraculously fed them all the day before. And now they're like, well, what sign are you going to do? You know, are you going to make bread magically appear on the ground that we could just pick up this time? You know, show us something more impressive. Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, it is not Moses who has given you the bread out of heaven, but it is my father who gives you the true bread out of heaven. For the bread of God is that which comes down out of heaven and gives life to the world. Then they said to him, Lord, always give us this bread. 
Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will not hunger, and he who believes in me will never thirst. But I said this to you, uh, but I said to you that you have seen me, and yet you do not believe. And later down in verse 48 and following, he says, I am the bread of life. Your, your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness, and they died. This is the bread which comes down out of heaven, so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down out of heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread also which I give for the life of the world is my flesh. Then the Jews began to argue with one another, saying, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? So Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no, lives in your, you have no life in yourselves. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is true blood, and my blood is true drink. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. As the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so he who eats me, he also will live because of me. This is the bread which came down out of heaven, not as the fathers ate and died. He who eats this bread will live forever. So a very powerful metaphor here used by Jesus, talking about eating his flesh and drinking his blood. And it reminds us of what he said at the, at the, Lord, at the Last Supper. He said, take and eat, this is my body. And with the cup, drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. You know, so that's a, a very dense passage, a lot of stuff there, and a lot could be said about it. But I think what I took away from it after reading it was that God provides. You know, as God provided the manna in the desert and provided the loaves and the fishes the day before that keep us alive for another day, God also provides the real, the true food and drink through the sacrifice of Christ's blood, or through the sacrifice of Christ's flesh and blood on the cross that leads to eternal life. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm studying a commentary on, on the book of John right now, or reading through a commentary, and it said about this chapter, it says, in short, John 6 does not directly speak of the Eucharist. It does expose, however, the true meaning of the Lord's Supper as clearly as any passage in Scripture. So like the people in the story, you know, who are merely looking for earthly bread, um, you know, our day-to-day -day focus can be, you know, what's, you know, what's the next, next mouthful of earthly bread, whether that be in the form of food, drink, money, prestige, power. That's what we can tend to focus on day-to-day. -day. But instead, now let's meditate on and partake in the true spiritual feast that Jesus provided through the sacrifice of his flesh and blood on the cross, which does indeed lead to eternal life. Let's pray. Father, we, uh, we do thank you um, for the power that you displayed through Christ's sacrifice of his flesh and blood on the cross. We pray that in our lives we may truly feed on Jesus' flesh and blood through relying on him, believing in him, uh, for, for our life from your hand, God. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. We're going to sing the old rugged cross. 
part two. <laughs> First of all, wow, it's been a great service. Um, yeah, thanks for everybody for joining us. I do have a, a couple more announcements that we left off of the initial one. Um, first up, in uh, Kansas City, uh, the ladies are, are inviting us, uh, of the Gateway Women, to come to a time of fellowship and teaching on Zoom. All the feels, women's workshops uh, with a special guest speaker, Elizabeth Thompson. Uh, this will take place this coming Saturday, April 17th, from 9.30 a.m. to 11 a.m. It is free. Uh, can we learn how to identify, express, experience, and yes, sometimes wrangle our feelings in order to live a vibrant, healthy, fruitful life for Jesus? Absolutely. And the Bible can show us how. Get ready to throw open the doors of your heart, bringing the God to your emotions and your emotions to God, the one who invented feelings and always welcomes yours. Um, and it is a free event. The link can be found on Zoom, um, or the link, can be, the link can be found on our website, but also on our church app. Look for uh, the under the Four Women page, and you'll find it there. Um, also, uh, Bible Talk leaders, we have our leaders meeting at 1 p.m. today. Uh, you should have received that link by text. Um, if you need it, uh, reach out to me or uh, reach out to any of us on staff. <laughs> we'll send it to you. Uh, and then lastly, I have a note of thanks that I want to read from our brother, brother and friend, Karan Jacobury. Dear Gateway family, I want to express my heartfelt thank you for all of the prayers and your support, the, vis the cards, meals, care baskets, visits, encouraging notes, texts and calls, etc. After weeks of physical and occupational therapy, I have been cleared to return to normal activity and return back to work. The doctors and therapists have been amazed by the progress. No doubt, this is a result from your unyielding faith and prayers. As the song goes, you had me on your mind, took the time and prayed for me, and I'm so glad. You prayed for me. I'm extremely humbled and grateful for you all. Your brother in Christ, Karanja, and family. We're getting ready to wrap up. Man, what an amazing service. Sam, Dan, Bill, the songs. It. I thought Easter was fantastic. This is just taking it to a whole new level. So as we're getting ready to wrap up, there's some specific things I want to call us to pray for and about. First is Vince's uncle. Unfortunately, uh, he lost his uncle, and keep his family in your prayers at this time that uh, just that God will support them. Also, we want to pray for Kathy's family. They had a, a horrible accident uh, with the Rosarios. Uh, they lost a, a nephew, and please keep them in your prayers as well. Last, I want to lift up um, Bill's uncle, Ed Sanders. He's having surgery tomorrow, and it is a really important surgery. So please have that on your heart, not only today but tomorrow as well, that everything goes well and it just comes out of it. And again, more testament to the power of prayer. And so let's, let's go to God in prayer. Father God, at this time that we're wrapping up our service, we want to pray for Vince's family to be that God of comfort, to be that God that is there meeting needs. We want to pray for the Rosario family with the just untimely loss of a nephew. Again, be that God of comfort, be that God that is meeting needs on all the levels. And last, Lord, pray for Bill's uncle that not only guide the hands of the surgeons, all of the people involved with the medical process, but that you're there to touch what needs to be done and he can come out of this on top of it. And so he knows where the power comes from. Lord, we pray this and everything in your son's holy name. Amen. Amen. All right, so we're going to wrap up. We thank you so much for being here in person, for being with us online. And with that, we're going to come to a close. So, Hadrian, let me know when we're all wrapped up. Yeah. All right, sounds good. <laughs>